We celebrated love <laughs> and we danced and it was amazing. And then the rocket started and gunshots everywhere. We managed to escape, but there were a lot of friends that didn't. What we will do to our enemies in the coming days will reverberate with them for generations. A missile hit in the square and there was rubble hitting us as we were walking. There was glass, metal. It was like doomsday. There are civilians here who are not our enemy and we do not want to target them. We are asking them to evacuate. There are 50 people in the house without any food, drink, water or electricity. I don't know how we'll provide food for our children. War isn't what we're looking for, but war was forced upon us by a bloodthirsty terrorist organization. On the 7th of October, Hamas attacked Israel. More than 1,200 people were killed and a further 200 were taken to Gaza as hostages. It was the largest loss of Jewish life since the Holocaust. Israel's military response was swift. At the time of this recording, Gaza's Hamas-run government says more than 15,000 people have been killed there, including thousands of children. A moment ago, you heard from some of those at the heart of this story in Israel and in Gaza. But the impact of the conflict is being felt far beyond the Middle East. From Cape Town to Paris, London and New York, reports of hate crimes have risen dramatically. It's a difficult evolution to measure, but our global team of Bloomberg journalists have been collating the data, allowing us to build a unique picture of rising anti-Semitism and anti-Arab, anti-Muslim sentiment. For this special programme, we've brought together some of the journalists who worked on this project to hear what they found out and from some of those affected. Let's start in New York and our Bureau Chief Katia Porzakanski is with us for this. Katia, what's changed in New York for the Jewish and Muslim communities since the 7th of October? I'd say New York is on edge. The city is a home to the largest Muslim population in the United States, but also the largest Jewish population outside of Israel. We've had demonstrations in the streets starting the day after the attacks in Israel. <laughs> And seemingly haven't stopped. It's been a constant flow of demonstrations in the streets and on campuses, and it's putting all the communities on edge. Katie, a lot of this discourse has been playing out, as you've said, in universities. What is the conversation that's being had there? What sorts of things have we been hearing from, from people attending those universities? So in the United States, universities are in large part bound by freedom of speech, which means you can say a lot. You can protest, of course. You can hold signs. You can say hateful things in large part. Universities, however, are also bound by the Civil Rights Act. They have to protect students from discrimination. So you're having this kind of strange situation happening on campuses where the bounds of free speech are really being tested, but at the same time, administrators are being scrutinized to make sure that they're not allowing for discriminatory environments. The Anti-Defamation League has seen a tremendous surge in anti-Semitism incidents in the country and says a large bulk of them are happening on campuses. You have assaults, threats. Uh, in Cornell University, a student was arrested for making threats to kill Jews on campus and to shoot up the kosher dining hall. But then you also have, you know, the perceived anti-Semitism that students are feeling, for example, from some of the signs that are being held at some of the demonstrations on campus. And that's where you get into kind of this gray area where one student is saying, look, this is a direct threat on my life. And another student might say, you're misinterpreting what I'm saying here. I spoke with two individuals who are trying to bring the two communities together, Rabbi Mark Schneier and Imam uh, Shamsi Ali. And they met with a Jewish community of students from different schools in, in the New York area. And then they met with a community of Muslim leaders, similarly from the schools in the area. And, you know, one of the first things that happened in their meeting with the Muslim leaders was the Muslim students said, we are not pro-Hamas. And we are being conflated as being pro-Hamas. We are trying to demonstrate 
for the citizens of Gaza that are being killed. When you talk to Jewish students, you know, they're saying you have signs that are saying from the river to the sea, and that is a direct threat for the eradication of Israel and a threat on my life, potentially. So these are the nuances that are appearing. But then there are also very blatant acts of hate that are really concerning to leaders. We'll come back to New York in a moment, but I want to go next to Paris and Bloomberg's Jenny Che. Now, France is home to the largest both Jewish and Muslim communities in Europe. That's numbers based, though, on survey evidence because official statistics in France don't include religion due to the secularism principles enshrined in French law. Jenny, I want to talk to you about how much we know about how much hate crime has increased in France since the 7th of October. It's really hard to quantify the change in the number of hate crimes in France since the start of the war. The French government has been very vocal about the rise of anti-Semitic acts in the last few weeks, but authorities have not been very good at providing comparative data, particularly about the number of acts targeting Muslims in the same period. And you have seen the government is taking a different approach to these two different communities. There was a cross-country march against Sunnitism held earlier in November that drew 180,000 people. And several government officials, including the Prime Minister, Elizabeth Bourne. Obviously, it was important for me to be here with my government to say that France must protect all of its citizens who may be worried because of their origins or their religion. The government and all ministers want to say to all our fellow citizens of the Jewish faith that we are at their sides, we are alert and we will not let anything pass us by. On the other hand, a few days after the war, the government tried to issue a blanket ban on pro-Palestinian demonstrations. Later, a court ruled that it was up to regional authorities to decide on a case-by-case basis. But we're seeing this uneven data and this different approach to the communities, and that's it's made it hard to track the difference in acts targeting Jewish people here and Muslim people here. France has seen several high-profile anti-Semitic attacks in recent years. The attacks on a Jewish school in Toulouse in 2012, the supermarket attack in, in 2015 as well. How have the community been responding to this latest rise in anti-Semitism? So the government has given numbers on uh, anti-Semitic acts since the start of the war, and there have been more than 1,500, and that's more than three times all of uh, 2002. But it's partial data, so they haven't uh, produced data on anti-Muslim acts. But the result has been that there is more concern within the Jewish community, and uh, Yonatan Arfi, the president of uh, CRIF, which is an umbrella organization for Jewish groups in the country, said that some Jewish people have changed their day-to-day behaviors, and that might include a notable kind of removing outward religious symbols, such as taking the Star of David off their necklace or changing their names to a less Jewish sounding name when they're putting in an order on food delivery apps. Let's go to South Africa next. Michael Cohn is our South Africa government reporter in Cape Town. Of course, Michael, the history of racial division is well known in South Africa, but this is a conflict that's created a very different kind of of schism. The government's position on the Israel-Hamas war, how is that affecting the Jewish community there? Traditionally, relations between the Jewish community and the government have been pretty cordial. We've seen the rabbis being invited to speak at major national events. We've seen the president going to visit synagogues and so on. Since the outbreak of the war, that relationship has really gone down the tubes. And the Jewish community is really, uh, really unhappy about the position that the government has taken. South Africa is one of five developing nations that's called on the criminal court to investigate whether the Israeli authorities are guilty of war crimes. They are really uh, very disappointed at the government's failure to express their sympathies about all the people that were killed in southern Israel, the relationship really is, is at an all-time low. Incidents of anti-Semitism here have also spiked. Um, we've seen a number of protests on a weekly basis. We've, been, we've seen protests from both sides. The situation really is at its lowest ever. Michael, I wanted to bring in one of the interviews that our team has conducted for this piece. Karen Milner is the national chairperson of the South African Jewish Board of Deputies. Let's take a listen to what she has to say about this. Uh, We've seen over 80 incidences of anti-Semitism in the last month, 
and the severity of those are much, much worse. We've seen a rabbi who was attacked in his car. There was an attempt to drive him, to push him off the road. He was subject to gross anti-Semitic abuse, and there was an attempt to ram his car. So that's one example of the level of violent anti-Semitism that we're starting to see, unfortunately. So that's Karen Milner from the South African Jewish Board of Deputies. We've also been speaking to Roshan Dadu, who's the coordinator of the South African Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Coalition. Let's take a listen to her position. Well, I would question the fact that there's been a surge of anti-Semitism mm. because, again, I think people who are opposing what the State of Israel is doing, opposing this genocide, are anti-Zionists. It's against the Zionist project. Of course, that's very strong language that some people would find offensive and Jewish people would indeed say is representative of the sentiment that they're experiencing in many parts of the world as well. Michael, how complex is this relationship in terms of its evolution and how we can consider how serious this increase in, in anti-Semitic incidents has been? The Jewish community is a really very small component of the population, less than 0.1%, uh, but they have played quite a prominent role in, in the legal fraternity, in business, and so on. I think it's a really tricky time for the Jewish community here. We've seen leaders saying that the government is not standing up for them and that they're really concerned about their future here. Most of the protests that we've seen have been reasonably peaceful. We had one uh, pro-Israel protest that was broken up by some pro-Palestinian supporters and four people were arrested. I think there there are concerns that, that things could spiral out of control. Of course, the Muslim community in South Africa is much larger, the country home to almost a million Muslims. Have there been a rise in incidents of Islamophobia as well? I haven't picked that up uh, in any meaningful way, I think partly because the Jewish community is so small, but there'd be no incident of anything in that direction. I mean, we've seen security at schools and synagogues being intensified. I don't think it's happened at Muslim schools and mosques. OK, let's come back to London next. Our reporter Eamon Farhat is here with me. Now, London, Eamon, like New York, is somewhere where there is a significant amount of data that can help us to understand what's happened since the 7th of October. What numbers are available, first of all, and what have they told us about the trend? So according to the Metropolitan Police, on average, there's about 60 cases of anti-Semitic crimes in London every month. But in October, just after the attack, there have been 533. That's almost nine times more than usual. And for Islamophobic attacks, it's the same thing. It's about two to three times as much as the norm. So definitely been a huge surge of it. It's also what we hear when we talk to people in the street. I spoke to different community leaders. I spoke to rabbis, to imams, and they're saying that tensions are very, very high. You know, we've had mass protests on the streets. Basically every Saturday. And this culminated on the 11th of November, we had this big protest that kind of came to clash with some far-right groups. So the 11th of November is Remembrance Day in the UK, remembering um, the fallen soldiers across different wars, but specifically for World War One. And lots of people from the far-right decided to call on their supporters to come down to London to protect the monuments. And this did cause some clashes with the police. 18 police officers, I think, were injured, uh, lots of violence there. The protesters were mostly peaceful, but there is a lot of tension around this. One of the interviews that you have conducted around this issue, Miriam Berger is the senior rabbi of the Finchley Reform Synagogue, and you spoke to her just before that demonstration in London. I I think it's a really difficult time to feel safe as a Jew um, in in London at the moment. Um, I don't think that cancelling the rally would have been um, something that would have made us feel safer. It would have potentially made more people more committed to doing something that, um, you know, this way comes under the auspices of the police to be able to patrol, to be able to work in dialogue with the organisers and to be able to be in dialogue with the Jewish community to say, how can we help to make you feel safe at this time? So, um, you know, I, I think everyone's doing what they can do and hoping for the best that extremists um, don't win out, but actually the nuanced, the moderate voice is the one that we hear going forward and the one that's able to bring people together. I mean, it was the question of policing that was central to the political debate around that particular protest. Is there a sense that authorities have moved on from that response now? How are they approaching this issue, given the rise in incidences that you've told us about? 
You're exactly right. Politicians, some call for these marches to be banned, but at the end of the day, the Met Police, they have, you know, plans in place to keep people safe and all that. And when you talk to the different community groups, whether it is, you know, Miriam, who you just had the clip there, or to different people in the Muslim community, they do say that they are working constantly with the police to make sure that people are safe on public transport, at these marches, and most of the time it works very well. You know, that has been quite a positive message. And Sidi Khan, who's the mayor of London, he's also really put an emphasis on this kind of bringing communities together you know at the remembrance service for this that was just before this march he had a multi-faith element where you had people from different communities giving prayers and he really really tries to get people to work together on this issue and really not talk about the divisive topics but more bring people together let's take a listen to some of that interview with Sadiq Khan you know these things have happened in the past uh, this is the worst I've known it I used to be a communities minister in 2009 when Israel was involved in a military altercation with Gaza, I think December 27th to middle of January. And I remember then as a community minister, the impact on communities across the country, this is worse than that. That was the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan there. Eamon, I wonder when we look at the response from authorities, from the likes of Sadiq Khan as well, does this give the communities in London a sense of safety in somewhere where we have seen the rise in incidents like these? I mean, right now, safety is not a word that most people talk about. I mean, people do feel unsafe, you know, at the moment. I think a lot of people say that as this war goes on, if this war continues for however long, these tensions will continue. There is a realisation that London, you know, is a good place for different communities and eventually things will get better. But right now, people do not feel safe. But let's go back to Paris and our reporter, Jenny Che. We talked earlier about the French government's attempt to ban some of these demonstrations and the subsequent legal cases that came around. Is there a sense the French government has come up with a coherent response to this problem? I'm not sure they have. I spoke to Abdallah Zekri, president of the French Council of the Muslim Faiths Observatory on Islamophobia, and he told me that it would have been better to have a march for peace. Because when you have government officials, of course, joining a march against anti-Semitism, it can leave the impression that the government is mainly supporting Israel, and some people in the Muslim community might feel alienated. At the same time, the government has also not really been able to provide coherent data on the Zaks. I mean, they're, they're obviously speaking a lot about the rise of anti-Semitic acts since the war, but the fact that they haven't given comparative data for acts against Muslims over the same period it raises questions about the kind of data that is being compiled and whether it's being compiled in a way that makes it easy to analyze so that the country can track these racist and discriminatory acts during times of conflict, but also during normal times. Katia Porzakansky in New York, you talked us through the debates that are happening uh, in universities, the demonstrations that are happening on the streets of New York City. Are communities, both Jewish and Muslim, feeling comforted by the actions taken by authorities? In terms of school authorities, no. I think everyone is displeased on both sides. The Department of Education has now opened seven investigations into schools in the United States. Three of those schools are in New York for discrimination. So the pressure is on for them to kind of get the situation under control. But both sides are are disappointed. For example, in Columbia University, they suspended temporarily two of the pro-Palestinian student groups for repeated violations when it comes to their demonstrations, including one that proceeded against the rules and that included intimidation. But by shutting down those groups, they've now spurred all sorts of accusations of shutting down free speech, chilling criticism of Israel, and faculty and students have written in protest against the school for doing that. From the Jewish community, they want to see more action taking place. They want to see quicker responses to acts of anti-Semitism. A few students at Columbia University gave a press conference a few weeks ago about anti-Semitism that they faced at the school and how there has been an unsatisfying response from administrators to investigate those accusations. My Jewish sisters and brothers and I are on the receiving end of death threats from our peers Undergraduates who have filed reports about these incidents have been left with no emotional support, no feedback, and no consequences for the perpetrators of these hateful actions. As a result of this inaction, there are Jewish students who do not feel physically safe on campus. At Cooper Union, several students came out and said they felt completely unsupported by the school when there was a protest that got intimidating. And there was some students that entered a library. There were some Jewish, visibly Jewish students 
in the library and behind a glass wall and uh, the protesters were banging on the on the wall. Um, that was a very intimidating moment for those students. So there was a lot of scrutiny on that event. Like, what happened? Did the school not have control over that protest? Um, so there's an investigation there, too. So that is something that administrators are currently grappling with. There's also been tremendous scrutiny from alums, donors, and employers. We reported about a list of dozens and dozens of of law firms that wrote to the top law schools in the country saying you have to do more to protect against anti-Semitism on your campuses with kind of, you know, a veiled threat there. If you don't, you know, we're going to be thinking twice about hiring from your schools. Indicative of, of some of the high profile attention that's being paid to this issue in New York. Michael Cohen in Cape Town Is there a sense that that same attention is being paid to this issue where you are? I think there have been recent attempts by the government to kind of cool things down, but um, we had uh, President Cyril Maposi write a weekly letter to the nation in which he was saying there's no place for violence or threats or, or threats of violence against those who hold contrary views that South Africa's painful history must be a re- reminder about the cost of a divided society. And there have been meetings between Jewish organizations and the government, but at the same time, the government's actions are clearly uh, reiterating its extremely pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel stance. I don't think while the Jewish uh, organizations have said they appreciate that the meetings with the government and so on, I don't think they appease the, the authorities are taking any kind of steps to defuse the situation in, in a way and, and they're still really unhappy at the stance that the government has taken. Okay, I want to come back here to London and, and bring you one more clip of another interview. This is with Iman Atta, who's the director of Tel Mama, which is the National Anti-Muslim Hater Islamophobia Monitoring and Support Service. Listen, as long as the conflict in Israel-Palestine is going, I don't think things will stop here. Although it's thousands of miles away from us, but it's impacting our communities here heavily. Unless that conflict stops, that's when things maybe would start coming back to normal. And I wouldn't say it would come back to normal as you'd see everyone happy and everyone talking with each other. No, it will take a lot of time. And there are bridges that must probably have been broken. There are bridges that are shaken. These are the ones that most probably can get back to reconnecting. But there's many bridges that unfortunately got broken this time because people are just too angry. People have got... Too many emotions going, people are grieving, people lost loved ones, and people just don't seem to see the humanity in each other. That's Eamon Atta of Tel Mama speaking to Eamon Farhat. Eamon, I wonder, we've heard this from, from various interviews, there being a, a sense of breakdown among the communities. London prides itself on being this multicultural city that welcomes communities from all over. Is there a sense that the damage that has been done can be repaired? I think what happens in the Middle East is a huge, huge impact on what happens in London. Even though it's thousands of miles away, it still affects people here. There's just so much trauma, you know, as she said in that clip, you know, people have lost loved ones and people are very angry whether you know on both sides the politicians rhetoric doesn't help either you know some people have been inflaming things social media as well as a huge issue i think in this, in this whole debate tell mama actually in their own data they show that more than half of hate, hate crimes is online i think the online community and the online space is helping stoke a lot of this hate keep people angry keep people in these echo chambers and so right now it seems very very difficult until things get resolved in the middle east Bloomberg's Eamon Farhat in London, Katia Porzakansky in New York, Jenny Che in Paris, and Michael Cohen in Cape Town. Thank you to you all. After we recorded this conversation, three college students of Palestinian descent were shot and seriously injured near the University of Vermont's campus in Burlington. While police said they have no additional information to suggest a motive, they noted that two of the victims were wearing traditional Palestinian scarves known as kafiyas at the time of the assault. I'm Stephen Carroll. Thank you for listening. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.